I've been looking forward to this one because this week we're starting, um, we're, and we're going to kind of hit or miss this off and on. And this is the favorite verses that you guys, we asked you guys to give us favorite verses that you would like to hear sermons on. And so what we're doing is we're looking through the list and I've picked one. I will also be doing one next week. Uh, so you can keep that in mind. So we're going to look at favorite verses today. So what I'm going to do is pray, first of all. I need to pray. And then uh, I will read the passage of Scripture. And then we will look at what we have here. Okay? So let's pray. So Father, thank you. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, your kindness to us. We thank you, Lord, that, that really, technology-wise, we don't need that. We have you. All things are in you, Lord. So we are grateful for that. It's amazing to me, Lord, that throughout history, your church grew and was sustained and did great things without technology. So, Lord, we thank you for that. So bless our time this morning. I pray that as we look at your word, that you'll show us, show us things that we need in our own hearts, in our own lives, Lord. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of this message, uh, I've changed. I, I don't know if Jim's got the title or not. With, all, uh, with God, all things are possible, which is, the, which is the favorite verse that we will be talking about. With God, all things are possible. It's Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. We are going to read verses 16 through 26 so we can put the verse into context. We don't want to just take a verse and preach on it because we may miss something. We may, we may actually be wrong in how we interpret it. We, I've done that. We take, we take verses and go, I really like this one. And we just kind of run with it. And when we start to look at the context of it, we go, wait a minute, maybe I should have looked at it this way or I got more out of it. So we're going to look at the context of this. It's a story uh, and I, it's a lesson it's a lesson for a particular person. I think it's a lesson also for the disciples. And I think it's a lesson for us as well. So let me read verses 16 through 26 of Matthew chapter 19. Verse 16, And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, all these things I've kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at this particular passage in this verse, and we're not going to go into the whole camel through the eye of a needle thing. We're not going to take some time to do this. We want to focus a little more on people and their responses and how they can grow. So uh, we're going to look at that. So this is an event in the life of Jesus. Jesus had many events in his life. There are many stories to read. There are many things to learn from in these stories. And we want to make sure that, like I said, we want to make sure we put them into context. Um, 
so we get it the right way. But there are lessons for us to learn here. My main point of this message is the disciples' amazement that it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven clarifies that it's God who not only saves, but with God, all things are possible. The disciples' amazement that it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven clarifies that it's God who not only saves, but with God, all things are possible. So my points this morning, we'll go through them as we reach those particular places. But my first point is we often have the wrong idea. We often have the wrong idea about things. I've done that many times. When we get the wrong idea about things, usually something goes horribly wrong because it's the wrong idea. If we misunderstand, we don't have understanding, we know that things can go awfully wrong. It, Roxanne and I have had those, those discussions before and things have gone awfully wrong, crash and burn kind of conversations because we don't, have the, we don't understand or we don't have the right idea of what we're trying to communicate. So we try to work on these things. Our passage says that somebody came to see Jesus. In the, in the subheading of that passage, it's talking about the story of the rich young ruler. There's nothing in here that says that he's a rich young ruler. He is rich and he is young, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's a ruler. It could mean he's a ruler because usually people that were rich usually were rulers of some sort. They had some sort of political authority or something along that line. So, We'll refer to him as the rich young ruler because that's tradition, uh, but it doesn't really say that. He wasn't somebody that was trying to come and trick Jesus. You know, there were a lot of people that did that. The Pharisees would try to do that. The Sadducees would try to do that. He was not trying to come to trick Jesus in some way at all. He was more concerned about his soul. And that's why he was going to Jesus. He wasn't sure about his relationship with God. He does believe in an afterlife. He believes that death is coming. He believes that there is, at some point, his life is going to end, and he's concerned about that, um, that he won't be a part of the good side of that, that he won't be a part of eternal life, and that's concerning to him, and he wants to find out more. He felt there must be something that he should do what good deed can I do to fix this, to make sure that I have eternal life? So he says, let me go to somebody who might know. Just so happens he goes to Jesus. That's a good one to go to. If you're going to go to somebody a question like this, go to the one who knows. And Jesus is the one who knows. And he felt that he would be able to fulfill that need as to what he should have to do. He just needed to know. I want to know what has to be done, what I have to do. So this is Jesus' answer. The man's asking about eternal life, and Jesus says, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So the rich man says, which, which, which ones? Which ones? And he is wondering, really, he's wondering if some are more important than others. And we're going to get into this a little later in, a, in the second point. But he's wondering which commandments are more important than others. Maybe he could only get away with only, you know, what the important ones were. Maybe he's looking for the easy way out. So Jesus give, gives him some commandments. And like I said, we'll get into that in a little bit. And the man says, well, I already do that. So Jesus gets him to look at himself a little more. And this is where... He's going to try to understand. Jesus wants him to understand that he's not getting it. He doesn't have the right idea. He wants him to look a little deeper. He wants him to fully understand. Jesus wants him to look at his heart. Jesus is starting to probe in areas where none of us really like anybody to probe. And that's our heart, our emotions, our motives, and things along that line. Does he have a heart for God, or is he just looking out for himself? That's where we're at right here. So Jesus tests him by saying, well, sell all you have, 
Give to the poor and follow me. And the man goes away grieved. He's thrown into sorrow, if you look at the full meaning of it. It wasn't what he'd hoped for. That wasn't the answer that he wanted. That wasn't what he wanted. He wanted something that's really easy, that's not going to change his life for the present. He just wants to take care of what's going to happen at the end. Too often, that's what we look for. We're looking at the problems of the end, and we don't see what we have to do to get to the right end. And he didn't want that. He had the wrong idea. People get the wrong idea about God all the time. They don't understand. We're not humble. We're not teachable. And we're not teachable enough for someone to get and dig deeper in so that we can look at our heart and find out what's going on. So a lot of times we stay stuck in these wrong ideas and these wrong viewpoints. So what we're going to do is look at the second point. Don't fall prey to a worldly view. Because this was the man's problem. He had a worldly view of life. And he wasn't dealing with it. He was just going to just sorrowfully go away and not deal with it. Maybe through the rest of his life he dealt with those situations and we'll know at some point in time when all things are made known and maybe he'll be there. But we don't know. So the second point is don't fall prey to the worldly view. The disciples, and at times even the church, as I said, we have the wrong idea, and we have a worldly perspective about life and God and putting these two together. Putting life and God together sometimes seems very difficult to do, and we struggle with that. So we're going to look at that. This is as much of a lesson for the disciples, as I said, as it was for the rich young ruler. And when the rich man says, and the disciples hear what Jesus says, sell give and follow. The rich man, I said, as I said before, was grieved, but the disciples were shocked. They were like, what in the world are you talking about? Here's this really important, cool, rich guy. He drove up in a Ferrari, and he's got everything, and you're telling him to sell all he has in order to get into heaven. There's a sense of disbelief with the disciples, they're astonished. Then who can be saved? Who can be saved? What do you mean it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven? Aren't they the privileged ones? This is what culturally things looked like back then. The rich were very privileged. They had their act together. Everybody looked at them as being important. What do you mean a rich guy can't get into heaven? If he can't get into heaven, who can get into heaven? See, too often we see success as being the great success. It is the place to be. They have made it. You've arrived. You have everything you wanted. We have parents and people that say, I am so proud of you. You have made it. You've you've." taken society by storm, and you're all set for life. You have money, you have status, and we honor that. And basically what ends up happening, whether we know it or not, we end up building this something into people that think that attaining things in this life is the goal. Now, I'm not saying we can't attain things in this life, but we think that that's the goal. And that's more important than anything else. We see what looks good to us. We look at the outward appearance of things. And sometimes we honor it. Sometimes we envy it. Because we want what they have. And we say that's the way it's supposed to be. We apply it to society. What looks good must be good. That's the way we, we look at it. If it looks good, it must be good. Samuel had the same problem. Samuel, when he was trying to find the replacement for Saul, and he was, little did he know, he was looking for David to anoint him as the next king, and he goes to the family, and the first person he comes to of David's family was his oldest brother, Eliab. And it says in 1 Samuel 16, 6 through 7, it says, when they came, he looked on Eliab, 
And he thought, surely the Lord's anointed must be before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. Now, a lot of people use that as an excuse. Well, you know, the Bible says man looks on the outward appearance, so it's okay for me to look at everything on the outward appearance. No, we're supposed to have the heart and the mind of the Lord. It says man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And we need to start to look on the heart. We need to reflect on our own heart. Not just looking at everybody else's heart. We need to start with our own heart and be reflecting on that. We love to look at appearance. Uh, Roxanne, when she was in elementary school, and yes, they did have schools back then. <laughs> she'd get out of her cave in the morning. She'd have a pterodactyl egg for breakfast. What grade were you in when Cece was in, in, uh, in fourth grade? Okay. There was a new girl that came to school. Roxanne was telling me the story. And I said, I got to use this. She said, there was, a, there was a girl named Cece. Her father was a, she had just moved into the area in northern New Hampshire. Her father was a uh, forest ranger. And when Cece, when they all went out to recess, you know, they'd run around and Cece was the fastest runner. And everybody said, she is going to be amazing in life. She is the fastest runner. She's going to be able to accomplish great things. And that's how we look at things. We look at some great accomplishment. Take your high school yearbook, for instance. My, my 50th high school reunion is coming up. That's frightening. My 50th high school reunion, the two of us that are probably still alive will be there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Actually, it's funny. I'm related to a lot of the people that are going to be in there um, by marriage and things like that. So anyway, um, when we look at our high school yearbooks, what do, we, what do we tend to do? At the end of high school, they have all these ceremonies and they do all these things. And what they do is they, they vote on people. And they say, who is going to be most likely to succeed? Who, does us who do they usually choose? It's usually the captain of the football team, or the head cheerleader, or the real smart guy that's actually relatable. Okay, those are the people, those are the people that looked good, that performed well, and we said, yep, those are the people that are gonna succeed. And you see, the problem is, that was Samuel's, Samuel's idea. Oh, this guy looks good. He should be the next king. God's saying, huh? That's not how it works. That's not how it works. It's not a matter of how rich or how successful, how good of a cheerleader you were, whether you were the captain of the football team, or how fast you ran in elementary school. When it comes to God, he looks at the heart. He sees our sin. He sees our limitation. He sees our idols. He sees that things that nobody else sees. Dan was mentioning that this morning. When our eyes make a worldly perspective, our eyes are really, they're not seeing what is true. They're not seeing what is important. So the disciples were showing a lot of worldly mindset here. They were saying, this guy, he's got everything. He's made it. He's arrived. He's successful. But Jesus is saying, that's not the way you look at it. If the rich man can't into, can get into heaven, who can, they're saying. So it's good to see the rich man's concern about his going to heaven. It's, that's a good thing. I'm going to give him that. It's good that the rich man was concerned about him getting, himself getting into heaven. But... As we see, and we're going to read verses 18 through 22 here in a minute of uh, Matthew 19. When Jesus answered the rich man, we want to look at this a little more deeply. If you would enter life, keep the commandments, Jesus said. And so he said to him, verse 18, which one? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I've kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So which commandments? You know, there are a lot of commandments in Jesus' time. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this, uh, because we're not Jewish. You know, we don't, we not, uh, you know, if we were Hasidic Jews, we would, we would know this for sure. But in the Old Testament, just in the five books of Moses, okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, just in those books alone, there are 613 commandments. And it was tradition back then, as it is tradition in a lot of Hebrew uh, Jewish sects now, where they study these commandments and they try to keep these commandments. And there are a bunch of them. There are lots of them. Some of them are repeats as you go through and you say, oh, well, that's kind of like the Big Ten, you know. But the Big Ten is what we're familiar with. We're, we're familiar with the Big Ten commandments. But, um, but there are others in there that their commandments, their scripture, we look at them, but it says, you know, like one of them in Leviticus says, not to hate your brother with your heart. That's a good commandment. You shouldn't hate your brother with your heart. You shouldn't hate him with your mind either, but that's okay. Uh, it's, there's another commandment, don't embarrass, embarrass other people. Don't embarrass somebody. Don't um, oppress the weak. Don't slander. Don't take revenge. Don't bear a grudge. These are all in Scripture things that we should do, but these are the things that are going through the rich man's head. Which commandments? He's not just talking about the ten. We talk about the ten. He's talking about all these commandments in there. Don't bear a grudge. Teach the Torah to your children. Here's one. You shouldn't be attempting to contact the dead. Now, that's a commandment. You should not be contacting the dead. Here's another goodie. Do not turn the ways to the ways of idol worship. Don't, don't get into idol worship. Huh. Well, that's kind of what the rich man was doing. Don't get in the way of idol worship. It's putting something, I, having an idol is putting something before God, putting something in, in more importance than God is. That's what idol worship is. The last one we'll look at is not to turn people to idol worship. Don't cause others to have idols in their lives. Don't cause others to put things as more important than God is. It's idolatry. You know, when we raise our kids, what do we tell them? Do we teach them to idolize success? Does that become an idol in their life, a goal in their life? Do we set the love of money, the love of status, the love of family, the love of career, more important in God somewhere down on the list of all the other things that they should love, but it's kind of down farther on the list. How do we teach our kids unknowingly, because we want them to do well. And I'm not saying they shouldn't do well. They should get an education. They should have good jobs. They should make money. But where's God in the process? So there were a lot of commandments, and this is why the rich young ruler was asking, which commandments? The religious person was bound by the legal written law. And they, and they would just look at that and they would try to figure out how they could obey the law. And they would be looking down at the law, trying to figure out how to obey it so much, they were never looking up to the God who made it. They were never looking up and spending time making sure that they're not just breaking the law, but they, they should be having a relationship with the one who made the law, the one who gave the law. So when Jesus says what laws to obey and what they are, the rich man's probably feeling pretty good about himself because he kind of labeled 
a few laws there. The rich man say, hey, this, is, this isn't bad. He's probably relieved. He's happy about this. I've, I've kept all these. So this, this was probably his mistake. What do I lack? The rich man probably said, hey, thanks, see ya. And he would have felt good about himself, and he would, probably would have been deceived, but he would have felt good about himself. But he says, what do I lack? He wants to make sure all his bases are covered. Have you ever done that? I want to make sure all my bases are covered. I want to make sure I'm doing everything right. We can't do everything right. We've got to realize this. We're not going to get it all right. The rich man wasn't going to get it all right. He knew he was missing something. He knew he was missing a relationship. He knew he had to do something in his life. So Jesus offers an opportunity for a relationship. Listen, this is what you're missing. First of all, you've got to get rid of your idols. You've got to follow me. So Jesus says to him, if you would be perfect, or in the New American Standard Version, it says, if you would be complete, go sell what you possess, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, which is what he was concerned about. He wanted to go in heaven. You're going to have treasure in heaven. And then he says, come and follow me. Basically, get rid of the distractions out of your life. Come and follow me. That's what he's telling him. What kind of distractions do you have in your life? You could probably think of a few. I can always come up with distractions that are in my life. What keeps you from being fully engaged in your relationship with Jesus? Or even having a relationship with Jesus? What keeps you from having that? The rich man had a lot of distractions. And we have a lot of distractions. There are a lot of distractions out there. You see, the rich man wanted eternal life on his terms. He wanted to make sure that his bases were covered. But we don't sometimes, we we don't understand the cost of what eternal life brings. Becoming a Christian does affect your life. Becoming a Christian affects your life. You're changing the way you look at things. You're changing the way you do things. You're changing the way you live. You're changing who you worship. You no longer worship yourself or your things. Now God is your God. Sometimes we don't value the spiritual like we do the things in front of us. See, Jesus paid a great price. He paid a great cost. He gave his life for us. He fulfilled all the laws, all 613 of them, because Jesus was perfect. You see, at times we act like salvation or relationship is something that we can earn, or even we, we sometimes even think that we deserve it. And we don't. It's something that's a gift. It's something that we get from God. And that's why there's such disappointment, a disappointed reaction in the rich man. He loved the world, but he wanted to have all his ducks in a row before he died. He knew his, one day his lifestyle would come to an end, but he didn't want it to happen that soon. He wanted to enjoy his life all the way to the end. Scripture says, love not the world. John tells us in 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And Jesus tells us in John 15, 19, if you, were of, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. If you're of the world, the world loves you. Loves you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. As Christians, we are no longer a part of the world. And therefore, that's why when you watch on the news or you read different things, you see that there are persecutions of Christians because they are not of the world and the world hates them. They don't understand fully why, but the world hates them. As Christians, we have been chosen out of the world. We're not in the world anymore. Worldly success is no longer the goal. Again, I'm not saying we can't 
make money, we can't have jobs, we can't have careers. We want to have Christian doctors, we want to have Christian businessmen. But if you talk to those people that are Christians, their business isn't the idol. God's right at the forefront. We're not of the world. The world doesn't love you. You should not love the world. Don't idolize it. Don't put it above God. These are worldly things. They distract. So I have a question. I want, to think, I want you to think about your possessions. Think about your possessions. What place do they hold in your life? What value do they have? Are your possessions, your dreams, your goals, your life, are they centered around Jesus? Or are they kind of off over there and Jesus is somewhere else? Do you feel that Jesus is just one of your possessions that makes you feel like you're touching all your bases? How hard is it for a worldly person to get into heaven? Are you shocked? Are you shocked that a rich man can't get into heaven? Don't be. Just come to Jesus and come and follow him. Lastly, we're going to look at, at the verse itself. And the third point is the impossible is possible with God. The impossible is possible with God. And there are two parts to this verse. The first part is the most important one being salvation. With man, it is impossible to save himself. It's a scriptural truth. If we want to stay biblical, it's a scriptural truth, and we want to be that way. That's what it says. We say it over and over again. We say it in church. We repeat it over and over again. We cannot save ourselves. We need a savior. The gospel is the good news. That's what gospel means, is good news. Jesus came to save sinners. That's what the good news is. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need Jesus. We need a Savior. We need to talk about Jesus. We need to tell our friends and family about Jesus, about his coming, about his dying, that a person may be saved through him, by him, in him. You know, when I became a Christian, I was 18 years old when I became a Christian. And one of the things that I, I really thought was interesting was that I saw that there were people my age that knew God. And that was cool. But I also saw people that seemed older than dirt, like myself, that also knew God. And a thought came to me, you can know God all your life. You can have God involved in your life every year, every day, for decades, all your life. And they knew God. I wanted that. I saw these relationships that these young kids had, and I saw these relationships that these older people had, and I saw through the generations, people enjoyed God. And it was something that I want, a lifelong relationship with God and his people. Psalm 37, 25, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. It's a lifelong thing, relationship that God wants to have with us. Jesus is the one who saves. It's the good news. And it passes from generation to generation. The church has gone from century to century and the news has been passed along because people when they were young grabbed a hold of who Jesus was the old people taught the young that's the way it's supposed to be the old passed down to the young one of the most impacting things that ever happened to me as a young Christian it was a we were visited well I was in a Christian coffee house that's where I accepted the Lord and, uh, and we were a bunch of Jesus freaks, but there was an old pastor that came, uh, and this pastor's name was Earl Waterman. He, was, um, he, he wanted to come and just talk with us. We wanted to have him come. And he came, I think you were in Alaska during that time. I don't remember, but... Uh, um, and he came, and he was, also, he was also the one that led who I can 
considered my spiritual father to the Lord. He worked in the railroad, this guy did, but he also pastored. He was very handy, he was very practical, and he was very knowledgeable of scripture. So he came in and we're all sitting there and he opens up this ancient, ancient Bible. I think Jesus owned it, I, it was so old. He just opened up this Bible and that was impressive to me to begin with. And he shared about Jesus. He shared about Jesus' life and his death and his saving power and the, the power that impacts life, not just a, a thought of an ethereal kind of way, but a practical way that affects your life every day of your life. And he talked about the second coming, which totally our eyes were just wide open. He was saying, Jesus is coming again. It was captivating. It was encouraging our faith and our growth was growing. Our relationship with God was growing. It isn't about how well we obey the commandments or how successful we are. It was about Jesus and it still is. And talking about him and learning about him and figuring out what he wants you to do with your life that's, and then doing it, that's what, that's what we need to do. Jesus wants us to understand that. So that's the first part of that verse. The second part is, with, all th or with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. All things, if you look at the Greek in that, it means each or every, any, all, the whole, everyone, everything. That's what it's talking about. All things. All things are possible. All things covers the span of what God can do and who God can do it to. God is not only our salvation, but he can do more than that in our lives. He can change us. He can provide for us. He can care for us. All things are possible. We forget about this. We know the verse. Everybody's familiar with the verse, but we don't realize all things means all things. And sometimes we put these scary meanings to it, and what we're doing is God, God can take care of us. All things are possible. If you look at the word possible defined, the work is dunitas. The word is dunitas in the Greek. And it means that he is able enough. He is powerful enough. He is mighty enough. He's strong enough. He's wealthy enough. He's influential enough. God is all of these things. He is enough to do all of these things. When I read this verse, sometimes I start thinking of Philippians 4.13, where it says, I can do all things. When we say it's with God, it's all things are possible. And then I go, well, I can do all things. And I start to look at that verse. I can do all things through Christ, him who strengthens me. In our passage, with God, all things are possible. God is powerful. When I look at Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I tend to look at the first part of the verse, though. And this is where we can get into trouble. We look at the first part of the verse instead of the second part of the verse, or we don't look at the whole verse, and we start to read, I can do, I can do. And we get excited about that, I can do. And then we go a little more, I can do all things. And a lot of times we stop, <laughs> I can do all things. And we think it's some sort of positive thinking kind of thing. I can do all things through Christ, and if I think hard enough and strain enough, then I'm going to be able to do all of these things. We start to put our place, our life, and our thoughts in place of who God is. You know, there's a little Greek word in that passage. It's a two-letter word, E-N. They, they pronounce it hen. Hen. It means in, through, by, or with. In, through, by, or with. I can do all things through, or I can do all things by the way of Christ. I can do all things in him. I can do all things with him. You have to have that connection because that connects God to the rest of the verse. Jesus is the key. He's the one that gives strength as needed. With God, all things are possible. Therefore, I can do all things 
in, through, by, or with Christ who strengthens me. Um, talking about with, with God, all things are possible. Um, we've, shared, we've shared videos uh, about the Sobi family in Ukraine. And many of you know the story. They're, they're old friends of ours. We used to babysit Scott when he was little. And, uh, and he's in Ukraine with his wife and family. And you, we told you about the story um, of the Russians coming up to their village and actually the mayor going out there praying and asking God to help them. And the mayor going out and say, could you please just go around us? There's no, and the Russians just kind of went around them and did not bomb their area, did not take over their area. But over a period of time and after 50 days of the war, after, uh, the, on the 50th day, uh, as they were continually praying, and during that time, they served the people, they found food for the people, they, they did things that people were not able to do because God can do all things. They were able to, to <laughs> and, and you, you've heard the stories anyway, they were able to get van loads of bread for people where no one else could find the food for them. And it was just a miraculous, and they would say it, it's a, it was a miraculous situation. It was a God doing all things and powerful things to do that. So after the 50th day, uh, some of the church leaders, they were concerned about the Sobies being in that area because they were behind Russian lines. And Scott, being an American citizen, probably shouldn't be there. And uh, they, they said, you guys got to get out of there. And Scott was going to stay. And they said, no, we really feel that the, the, it's the Lord. You should get out of there. So what they had to do, and uh, the problem is, they had to, to get out of enemy lines, Russian lines, they had to travel 30 miles. Inside those 30 miles, there were over 20 checkpoints that they had to go through that the Russians had. And usually there were cars lined up just caravans of people trying to get through these checkpoints. So they just continued to pray. And the, somebody came in with a car and they said, listen, you guys pack whatever you can in a suitcase. Each of you can have a suitcase. Pack what you can. Now they lived there 18 years. Their home was there for 18 years. All they could take with them was what was in their suitcase. They go into the car and they start driving and they're praying. And they would go to a checkpoint and all of a sudden, the guy would just say, go ahead. There would, and there would be nobody there. There would be no cars lined up. They'd go to the next checkpoint. The person would look at him, and he'd, he'd start to get angry. He didn't know what to do with their papers and things like that. So he'd just say, oh, just go ahead. And they just kept going and kept going for over 20 checkpoints. They kept going through that. And they kept praying and asking God to help them. And God helped them. God, all things are possible. They were able to get into the village. What were they doing while they were there? Now that they're in this new village and they've been there another 50 days in this new city, um, which actually the Russians are getting closer and closer to and they're not sure what they're doing. But what are the, what are the Sobies doing while they're there? They're finding food for the refugees that are going through there. They're serving the churches, they're encouraging the churches, they're helping churches that have lost their pastors. They're doing whatever God has for them and God's given them strength, opened the door, provided a place to live. All of these things God is doing for them because all things are possible with God. Because all things. Now, in light of that, in light of that, and we're gonna pray about this in a little bit, In light of that, they had to leave so quickly that they were not able to bring the van that they used to get all the food. If you remember the videos, they had this big van and it was full of bread. They weren't able to take the van. And Scott said, you know what? I really wish we had the van back. And he's kind of looking. I, I was watching the video. He's kind of looking at the screen and he says, it would take a miracle. But you know what? They've seen miracle 
after miracle after miracle. So what I want to do, and we're going to do it at the end, is I want to pray and ask God to perform a miracle. Not, maybe not that van, maybe another van, but that God would provide something for them. He says it would take a miracle. They have mi experienced miracle after miracle. So we're going to pray for them in a minute um, that they would get that back. But you know what? We don't live in a war zone. We, we live life, but we have plenty of battles. Each one of us has our own little battles that we have to face. Each one of us, we just have all these opportunities to see God do impossible things. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's other trials. Maybe it's work difficulties. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's health. Whatever it is, there are battles that we're faced with. And we don't have to be in the middle of a war zone to see God do incredible things in our lives. The greatest of these things is salvation through Christ. Let's not be surprised what he can't do. Let's be envisioned for what he can do. Being a part of what God is doing because God is the God of things that are possible. So let's pray. Let's pray for Scott and Oksana and the kids. So Father, Lord, when we see your people out there helping, serving, preaching the gospel, sharing your word with anyone that'll listen, taking care of people's physical needs, Lord, we, we admire that, we esteem that. We don't idolize it because we know it's you. It's you working in their lives. And Lord, there are needs that they have, and Lord, we lift up a need. You have performed miracle after miracle in their lives. And we pray, Lord, that you would provide for them once again, that you would provide a van that so they're able to help do the work that you've set before them. I even pray, Lord, that in some miraculous way that you would bring their van 30 miles and bring it to them, that you would perform that miracle. But, Lord, if we look back at our own lives, we can look at miracle after miracle after miracle that you've performed We've seen things that you are possible. It's all things are possible with you. That you can do things that seem impossible to us. Lord, I pray that we would be reminded of those things that you've already done in our lives and help us to realize that we can look forward in faith, believing that you will care for us, that you will guide us, that you will direct us in wherever life takes us. So, Lord, help us. Give us greater understanding. Help us not to, to get the wrong idea. Help us to know fully that you are not only the God who saves, but you do the miraculous. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.